there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. The 20th century saw the dawn of a new type of warfare. Machines ruled the battlefield. Conventional infantry assault across no man's land was bound to fail. Flesh and blood simply could not get through that type of defense. A fierce arms race led to even more deadly weapons. Those gunners on the tanks had rounds in their cannons, and they were ready to execute if they were told to. Behind the lines, the development of powerful and innovative vehicles meant the difference between victory and defeat. This is absolutely one of the unsung heroes of the Second World War. The relentless pursuit of military supremacy would lead to machines capable of destroying humanity itself. There are very few mistakes you could make that wouldn't have some kind of catastrophic consequence. This time, the epic Second World War battle in the North African desert. Rommel is very much a doer, a fast-moving general, somebody who wants to get things done and is prepared to take risks. Facing Rommel, Montgomery's Desert Rats, one of the toughest units in the British Army. And it was meant to be a five-day operation. It turned out to be one of the finest British armoured operations of the Second World War. In a straight-up stand-up fight, the British had finally been the last man left in the ring. Success relied on both sides' combat machines and their extraordinary firepower. This tungsten core round would punch through the side of the turret and beat around inside until everything was either broken or on fire. Victory in the desert was hard fought, and it changed the outcome of the Second World War. On June 22, 1940, France surrendered to Nazi Germany after a battle lasting just six weeks. The German army, the Wehrmacht, stormed over First World War battlefields where their predecessors had been bogged down for four years. Both the French army and the British Expeditionary Force, or BEF, had been outmaneuvered. We lacked air cover. We lacked the right weapons and training to go with them. And also the fact was that the BEF had not expected virtually to have to take on the might of the Wehrmacht without the support of the French, whose army was crumbling. In the battle for France, British tanks were exposed as mechanically unreliable and often unable to penetrate the armor of the German panzers. It was a humiliation. But soon, a very different battlefront opened up, an opportunity for a second chance. How would the British Army's combat machines fare in the deserts of North Africa? The war in the desert began in September 1940 because of the territorial ambitions of the Italian dictator, Benito Mussolini. Mussolini felt deprived of victory. Germany had conquered France, he'd conquered nowhere. Britain was on the ropes in 1940, of course, had withdrawn from France and was beginning to fight the Battle of Britain. This seemed the opportunity for the Italians to move into Egypt. Hitler had no interest in North Africa or the Mediterranean. With the Battle for France over, his eyes were fixed firmly eastwards towards Russia. It was Mussolini who was trailing along in the coattails of his glorious ally, his armies deprived of any kind of victory. He wanted a win, and he wanted to take North Africa. Mussolini had a huge army in Libya of 250,000 men. His plan was to invade Egypt and seize the strategically important Suez Canal, getting access to the vital oil fields of the Middle East. 
opposing the Italians was the 36,000 strong Western Desert Force made up of British, Australian and Indian infantry and armoured units. They would soon acquire the nickname first given to the British 7th Armoured Division, the Desert Rats, inspired by the African rodent, the Jaboa. One of the tanks the Desert Rats placed their faith in because of its heavy armour and two-pound gun was this machine, a 29-tonne British infantry tank known as the Matilda. At the Tank Museum in Bovington in England, a World War II Matilda is being lovingly restored. It gives fascinating insights into the machine and those who made it. It came in for what was a routine bit of maintenance and it turned into, um, so far, a three-year rebuild. The aim is to get as many systems on this vehicle working as if it came out of the factory. There's a certain amount of engineering and archaeology that has to take place when you build something of this kind of historic value. Bolts are cut at certain lengths that are not come off the shelf in order that they're fit. Sometimes the sides of them are flattened in order that things can operate. The designers of the Matilda struggled to find an engine big enough to power it. They finally hit upon a solution. Not one, but two 95 horsepower diesel engines. That gave it a top speed of 16 miles per hour, faster than the Italian tanks. This is one of the pair of engines that's fitted to the Matilda tank. We're just getting it prepared for testing and running. In 1939, many British companies shifted their production to the war effort. Matilda tanks were constructed by firms such as Harland and Wolfe, who also built the Titanic, and the Vulcan foundry in Lancashire, famous for its powerful locomotives. The repair team at Bovington Tank Museum is constantly learning about the ingenuity of the men and women who made the Matildas. One key element of the Matilda's turret has been stripped down and repaired. This component here is called the rotary base junction. Its function is to transfer the electrical and the hydraulic power into the turret. The rotary base junction allows the Matilda's turret to traverse 360 degrees in any direction. This is the fixed part, and the top rotates and carries the hydraulic connections all the way around the turret. Inside this drum is a tower with electrical contacts in. The fixed wires come out from the hull, and they're bolted here. They relate to contacts that run down the side of here, and as the turret rotates, it maintains an electrical contact all the way around. In order to strip a component like this down, the electricians and the fitters at the time would have had a number of specialist tools in order to carry this out. We've had to make these special tools, and there's some examples of them here. They get from the um, Sublime, sometimes to uh, something a little more crude, but it's amazing how sometimes a bit of wood can help. In order to fix this particular component, we had to make upwards of nine tools. Normally, these would have been issued to the tank crews with the tank uh, when the vehicle went to the regiments. By the summer of 1940, the Desert Rats had about 270 tanks at their disposal, of which 50 were Matildas. On September 13, 1940, the Desert Campaign began. The Italians invaded British-controlled Egypt. After 60 miles, they stopped and dug in, creating a series of fortified camps. The man in charge of the British counter-attack knew the terrain well. His name was Lieutenant General Richard O'Connor. O'Connor was a professional soldier, pre-war regular. He'd uh, served with distinction in the Great War, but he knew the desert. He knew the capabilities of his British forces, and he knew the limitations of the Italian forces, and exploited both to great effect. O'Connor devised an ingenious plan, christened Operation Compass. 
Lieutenant General Richard O'Connor was arguably one of Britain's best generals of the Second World War. In Operation Compass, he was set a pretty ambitious task. With limited numbers of men, he was going to attempt to drive the Italians right out of Egypt. And it was meant to be a five-day operation. It turned out to be much more of a momentous operation than that. In fact, one of the finest British armoured operations of the Second World War. Operation Compass essentially set out to destroy the Italians, to destroy their attack uh, from Libya. As the Italians moved rather cumbrously along the coast road, the British forces simply penned them there, whilst O'Connor launched a major flanking attack, striking southward through the desert to roll up a line of frontier forts which the Italians had built, and to destroy their army by attack on the flank and rear. The hammer blow was provided by 50 Matilda tanks, which emerged out of the desert at speed. The Italians were thrown into confusion and panic. So we've got this situation where after some of the initial attacks, they're sending the Matilda tanks forward, almost with bravado, to crush down the Italian artillery, and that very quickly sends a level of despair through the Italian military that's infectious. They think they cannot fight against this new British tank that's appearing, which in the end gets its nickname, the Queen of the Desert. Nothing can seem to touch it. One Australian soldier wrote home, the sound of British tanks terrorised them, and the sight of our bayonets was enough to make them throw up their hands. Fascism. Pah. Operation Compass had pushed the Italians back. It took them completely by surprise. Their army began to crumble very quickly, and soon the Italians were thinking simply in terms of escape into the relative safety of Libya. Victory over the Italians had done something to repair the damage done by the humiliation of defeat in France. But how would the Desert Rats fare against a more deadly and sophisticated foe? The legendary German tank commander Erwin Rommel and the lethal combat machines he brought with him. The range and the flat trajectory of the 88 allowed it to reach out to enemy tanks before they were even within range of firing back. The round is leaving the barrel at the speed of 2,200 feet per second. After France fell to the German Blitzkrieg in June 1940, the British and their allies were in need of a victory. They were given a second chance in North Africa when in December, the Desert Rats and their combat machines routed the Italian 10th Army, who had hoped to capture Egypt and the Suez Canal. Then, to the surprise of the British, there was a chance to turn a victory into a stampede. An officer, Lieutenant General Richard O'Connor, had hastily assembled a flying column of fast vehicles to intercept the fleeing Italians. He gave his men orders to stop them at all costs. Leading the charge were scout cars like this one, built by British manufacturer Daimler and known as the Dingo. The Dingo is designed as a light reconnaissance vehicle and was part of the ethos of the British Army uh, for light mobility, so it acted as eyes and ears. The name Dingo is derived from Australian wild dogs, which is perhaps rather apt as this was used in the desert. As you can see, it's quite a compact vehicle, not very big, uh, just takes two crew. Uh, you've got the driver here on the right, gunner on the left, equipped with the 303 Brun gun for self defence. Armour, um, not too bad on the front. You've got 30 millimetre plates here, but only 12 millimetre on the side, so not so great on the sides. Obviously, you've got 360 visibility from the top, which is what made it ideal for desert warfare. You can see for miles on the flat desert terrain. If you saw a dingo coming over the horizon, it meant that there was a patrol on the way, which obviously signalled that there were larger forces behind them. So it usually alerted to you that trouble was en route.
Accompanying the dingo as part of O'Connor's flying columns was a vehicle with a better pedigree than any other British combat machine, the Rolls-Royce armoured car. Built on the chassis of the luxury limousine, the Rolls-Royce Silver Ghost, she was powered by a 7.5-litre straight-six engine that gave her a top speed of 45 miles per hour. Both the Royal Air Force and the British Army used these vehicles. By 1940, the armoured cars had been in service for 20 years and nearing the end of their operational life. But they remained popular with the Desert Rats, with good reason. The tanks, even then, were still not particularly serviceable all the time. They broke down quite often. That meant that the Rolls Royces themselves were much preferred because they could travel faster, they could travel further, it didn't take as much fuel, and if you like, the physical footprint, which is the dust, etc., generated by their movement across the desert, was nowhere near as great as the tanks. With a crew of four men, one of whom was a gunner, the Rolls could pack a punch. It had a Vickers mini machine gun, the ones you know from World War I and the trenches in the Somme. And latterly, it had a boys only tank rifle, which was capable of taking out most other armored cars and some light tanks. The Dingoes, light tanks and armored cars that made up Lieutenant General O'Connor's flying columns, headed south into the desert to race ahead of the Italian 10th Army as they fled back towards Tripoli in Libya. A bold flanking move through the desert, moving fast, hitting hard, exactly what light cavalry would have done in the previous century. They set up roadblocks at a place named Beda Fom, just 30 minutes before the remnant of the Italian 10th Army arrived. It still had a sizable amount of armor, and it still had a sizable amount of men. The problem it had was it did not expect, out of the morning mist, British armored vehicles to be blocking the course road to the south. The armored cars sealed off the pass, and the Italians would have to fight their way through them to get towards sanctuary. And effectively, after two days of fighting, the Italians almost are master in the town. O'Connor's plan had exceeded expectations. At the end of the Battle of Beda Fom, British officers were reporting the number of Italian prisoners they had in terms of acreage. They were saying, I have two acres of officers and 10 acres of other ranks. So many Italians in the hundreds of thousands surrendering. Despite the victory, the battle marked the end of an era for one of the Desert Rat's best loved combat machines. Bedefront saw the swan song of the Rolls Royce as a frontline armoured reconnaissance vehicle with the 7th Armoured Division and with the whole of the British Army in the Western Desert. It had operated in some cases for more than 20 years and was wearing out and wasn't as up to date as some of the more modern designs. Operation Compass and the Battle of Bay de Fom had helped to build the reputation of the Desert Rats. But on the 12th of February 1941, only five days after the victory at Bay de Fom, a more formidable force arrived in North Africa. The German Africa Corps, led by Lieutenant General Erwin Rommel and his columns of deadly panzer tanks. Rommel had made a name for himself commanding a fast attacking tank division in France in May 1940. Rommel is very much a doer, a fast moving general, somebody who wants to get things done and is prepared to take risks. But in the desert, the Fuhrer wanted his famous general to employ a more cautious strategy. In terms of the Africa Corps, the Germans, Hitler, had never intended to become involved in the North African War. That was Mussolini's folly, as far as he was concerned. Rommel's mission was simply to bolster the Italians. This is an Italian war. Rommel decided to ignore Hitler's orders 
He believed it was very much a German war. He would take on the British and their allies. But first, Rommel unloaded a weapon he knew would protect his troops and soften up the enemy. This is the legendary 88mm flak gun. It was a favorite weapon of Rommel's. When he first arrived at Tripoli, and his Africa Corps was just coming into port to support the Italians, one of the first things he did was to send an anti-tank battalion and a mechanized reconnaissance battalion out to the east of Tripoli to screen against the British coming west. And the anti-tank battalion had 88s in it. So one of the first things he did was deploy 88s in a defensive role to guard his entire sphere of operations. Built initially to arm pre-First World War dreadnoughts of the German Navy, the 88 is one of the most versatile weapons in the history of warfare and can be as equally devastating on land as at sea. So feared were they, the guns were outlawed as part of the Versailles Treaty in 1919, but not for long. When in 35, Hitler decides to denounce the Versailles Treaty. The guns are then being produced in most of the major metallurgy plants in Germany. In the rearmed Third Reich, the 88s were to be used as defense against aircraft. The Germans claimed that a shell fired from its 16-foot barrel could reach a height of 32,000 feet. It is designed primarily as a flak, which means Flieger Abwehr Kanon, basically anti-aircraft cannon. Then, during the Battle for France in 1940, Rommel gave the 88 a new role as an anti-tank gun. Rommel sees, though, if you use the 88 millimeter anti-aircraft gun, it has actually an armor-piercing round. He insists they turn and they fire at the oncoming British tanks. And he sees again there, he's got that lesson already before he goes to North Africa. He can see the benefit of firepower, such as the 88 millimeter, against vehicles such as the Matilda II. This is one of the shells for the 88 flag. This one is an anti-tank shell a solid 22-pound bullet. If we're firing any tank, there is no arming of the shell. One of the ammunition loaders will pick the shell up, shove it in the back of the breech of the weapon. Another cannoneer is closing the breech right behind it. In the anti-tank roll, the man who is sitting in the gun layer's seat is the one that's actually aiming the gun, and he signals the man behind him to pull the trigger. The round is leaving the barrel at the speed of roughly 2,200 plus feet per second. Range and the flat trajectory of the 88 allowed it to reach out to enemy tanks before they were even within range of firing back at the 88. Almost two miles. They can knock a tank apart from over 2,000 meters. They were very effective use of a weapon that was not actually designed for an anti-tank role. One British tank commander wrote, I saw three of the leading Matildas stop abruptly and burst into flames. I realized with dismay that the Germans now had an anti-tank gun to which even the Matildas were not immune. I understood clearly that none of our future battles would be as easy as the previous year. Even though the 88's shells carried no explosive, they could inflict terrible damage. This tungsten core round would punch through the side of the turret and 
beat around inside until everything inside was either broken or on fire. And the lighting on fire is not because it explodes, it's because it's just creating so many sparks as it spins around inside that metal box that anything that's in the tank is going to light up. It's purely kinetic energy weapon. The power of the 88s gave Rommel's men a definite advantage over the desert rats. But Rommel didn't only bring an anti-tank gun to the desert. He had at his disposal another lethal combat machine, the Panzer III. In February 1941, the German Africa Corps, led by Lieutenant General Erwin Rommel, joined their Italian allies in a campaign to win control of North Africa. Facing them was a British, Australian, Indian and South African force known as the Desert Rats. One of the big features of the Desert War from 1940 to 1942 is the way the tide turns so quickly from one side to another. The Italians have initial success. The Italians are then beaten effectively by the British. The British take their eyes off the ball. Rommel enters, a favorite of Hitler, somebody who's an ambitious, fast-moving man. Rommel brought with him one of the combat machines the Allies feared most, the 25-ton tank known as the Panzer III. As soon as the sun rises through the morning mist, the regiment starts to roll forward. We disperse into the desert, 40 to 50 kilometers an hour on our tackle. But the nicest is the attack, the German Panzer, our beautiful, wide, humming Panzer. Panzer, Panzer to the fore. The 18-foot-long Panzer III was designed in 1937 to be the main German frontline tank for any future conflict. As they think the Panzer III is going to be the vehicle that will be leading the attack, will be coming across potentially enemy tanks coming the other way back at it, they want to give it an anti-tank weapon. So they start off by giving it the standard 37 millimeter gun. That's the standard anti-tank gun for the whole German army. Many countries in the 1930s have anti-tank guns about this caliber. But the battle for France showed the Germans that the Panzer lacked sufficient firepower. The demand for a bigger gun came from the very top of the Nazi hierarchy. Now, very quickly, Hitler, who is so influential on German tank design, he is arguing for more protection on tanks, for more firepower. So under the Fuhrer's direction, the Panzer III was equipped with a 50 millimeter gun, far outmuscling the British tanks. Unfortunately for the British, a similar gun upgrade on the Matilda tank proved impossible. One of the biggest problems about putting a new gun on a tank is this idea of upgrading the vehicle by increasing its firepower. The turret circumference, the diameter there, tends to limit how big a gun you can fit in. The Matilda has a small turret circumference, which meant that an upgrade from its two-pounder just wasn't feasible. The Panzer III has a much larger turret ring that potential it has for getting more firepower means the Panzer III lasts longer in frontline service than the Matilda does. The tough conditions in North Africa meant that further adaptations to the design of the Panzer III were essential. The other issue about the desert, of course, is just the physical landscape they're going to have to cope with. That landscape with rock, with sand, with grit, all the time that's getting into the vehicle, you've got dust that can choke your filters, they're trying to keep those clean all the time so the engines don't stall. 
All these factors make desert warfare that much harder than perhaps the sort of scenarios, Northwest Europe, that these tanks have actually been designed for. So in the back, there's a made back TRM-120 engine that now has, for North African campaign, extra filtration put on it to help get the dust out before it actually reaches the engine to help cool that engine in the rear. This system helped the Panzer III achieve a top speed of 25 miles per hour. Although it was faster than most of the British tanks, the Panzer was still vulnerable to attack. A further modification was necessary. You'll see there's an extra almost inch of armor plate has been added as spaced armor at the front of the vehicle. That's where they thought they were most likely to be struck. That's where they put that extra protection on. The three-year desert conflict between the panzers of the German Africa Corps and the tanks of the Desert Rats took place over a stretch of land that bordered the sea, no more than 40 miles wide. And the problem is that the front line, if you like, was 1,500 miles long. And the desert war was called a pendulum. As the Allies advanced, the Germans retreated. As the Germans advanced, the Allies retreated. Rommel used ingenious tactics against the Allies, earning him the nickname the Desert Fox. His dynamism, his charismatic leadership, the lightning speed with which he moved and the instinctive feel he had for desert warfare made him a legend. Rommel would lure the British tanks to attack his anti-tank screen. As they broke through, they would be ambushed by 88mm flat guns. Meanwhile, the panzers would attack the British flank and rear. From the British point of view, we ended up, if we weren't careful, doing cavalry charges against German positions where the panzers would tempt the British forward, disappear behind a screen of anti-tank guns, and the British would afterwards be left licking their wounds, wondering what went wrong. Later on, as we get better at those tactics in the desert, we're less likely to fall for those sort of tricks that Rommel actually does of seducing the British into attack. In August 1942, after two years of fighting, Rommel had pushed the Desert Rats back to what was known as the El Alamein Line in Egypt. If the Germans broke through, North Africa was lost. The British, if they have to retreat further east, then Alexandria, Cairo, the whole of the Delta is open to the enemy. El Alamein for the British had to be the last ditch defense line. The situation was so serious. In Cairo, the British burnt official papers in case they fell into enemy hands. But could there be hope for the Desert Rats? Mechanized reinforcements appeared in the shape of a new, more powerful American tank, designed to take the fight to the Panzers, the M3 Grant. And it really improved the British chances of being able to take the Germans on head to head. And a new British commander arrived to take on Rommel, Lieutenant General Sir Bernard Law Montgomery. If Monty was on the job, the ordinary Tommy thought he would get the job done. By August 1942, three years after the start of the Second World War, the commander of the German Africa Corps, Erwin Rommel, had pushed the Allied force known as the Desert Rats back to El Alamein in Egypt. The strategically important port of Alexandria was only 60 miles away. If the Germans broke through, North Africa was lost. Morale among the Desert Rats was low. German tanks dominated the battlefield. One man was given the task of achieving victory. Britain's Lieutenant General Sir Bernard Law Montgomery. Montgomery has been described as being by one of his own subordinates as as quick as a ferret and just about as likable. But the men believed in him because he had this great charisma and confidence. Somehow, Monty was the British version of Rommel. If Monty was on the job, the ordinary Tommy thought he would get the job done. 
On the 23rd of October, Montgomery began the Desert Rats' fight back. They launched Operation Lightfoot. Monty was determined, in his words, to kick Rommel out of Africa for good. On the 23rd of October, the battle begins with this huge, iconic artillery barrage, the night sky lit up by the flashes of hundreds of Allied guns pounding the German positions. Montgomery's plan is the British would launch a feint in the south to draw the Germans south. At the same time, British infantry will push two corridors through the German minefields and through their defenses to allow the armor to pass through and attack the German tanks. Rommel was outnumbered. Along a 40-mile front, he had 100,000 men and 675 tanks, compared with Montgomery's 150,000 men and 1,000 tanks. And many of these were new American tanks, especially adapted for desert warfare, like the 30-ton M3 Grant. The M3 Grant had exactly what the desert rats needed, greater firepower. To match the German panzers, a 75mm gun had been added to the right-hand side of the tank. The turret with its 37mm gun was offset to the left for balance. The M3 Grant is really the first tank that the British were able to field in the desert that had a 75mm gun. Previously, they had been fielding smaller caliber weapons. Uh, a lot of the tanks had, for instance, a two-pounder cannon. The Grant really was a surprise to the Germans when they were actually being hit by 75mm shells at distances of more than uh, 1,200 meters. The Grant tank was something of a hybrid because it mounted a 75mm gun in its hull and a 37mm in its turret. This was something of an odd arrangement because the main firepower had less traverse than the smaller turret. The Grant is a modified version of a tank known as the M3 Lee. The British asked for changes to its communication system. The Lee tank actually had a crew of seven individuals. The Grant only had six men, and that was because the British asked for the radios to actually be put in the turret. American tanks had the radio down in the hull. So this allowed the British to have one less man necessary to operate the radio. It sounds like with one less man, it would be very roomy in there. It's really not, it's very tight. The M3 Grant performed well in the desert, but wasn't without its flaws. Most tanks were welded constructions, but the Grant was riveted, which meant that when under fire, it was a hazard to those inside. If those rivets are hit by an incoming shell, they can actually shear off inside the tank and create a ricochet effect that's very dangerous for the crew. The Grant had an aircraft petrol engine built by the American company Wright Continental. Although its top speed was a decent 25 miles per hour, it was a devil to start. It's got an airplane engine in the back, a radial engine, which uh, needs to be cranked uh, before you start the vehicle. It's quite the workout for the individual who gets lucky enough to be chosen to be the man cranking that engine. And you have to spin it about 50 times to make sure the oil gets into all of the cylinders. It still was certainly a significant weapon on the battlefield, and it really uh, improved the British chances of being able to take the Germans on head to head. Despite their new tanks and their numerical strength at El Alamein, for almost a week after Operation Lightfoot began, the Desert Rats had failed to break through the German and Italian lines. The battle is incredibly intense, the attrition in terms of armour on both sides is very high. Montgomery is utterly ruthless. He will not abandon a plan once it's been set in motion. But even he realises that Operation Lightfoot isn't going to achieve final break. At El Alamein, there was another battle going on. A war fought behind the scenes by the engineers on both sides to keep their tanks repaired and operational. Fighting in the desert was punishing for the men and their combat machines. The desert is very harsh terrain. It's largely waterless. The rocky surface is not all smooth sand. 
is murderously hard on vehicles. It degrades tank tracks, it shreds tires, the dust clogs engines. Those who maintain World War II tanks today, some former tank crew themselves, are only too aware of the dedication of those tank engineers. A lot is said of the camaraderie that exists between the crewmen that work on one of these vehicles. And having done it myself, you know, you, you never experience teamwork and a sense of purpose when four people, which is the amount of people it takes to run this machine, all have to work in concert in order to navigate over terrain, spot targets, load the correct ammunition, pick up the targets, fire and hit them. In order for all that to work, once that breaks and that vehicle is broken down, another gang of people come up and turn, and in very adverse conditions, such as in the desert, without often the correct equipment in order to fix it, they have to repair this thing in, under fire sometimes and get it back going again. Part of the reason that we do this kind of work is a homage to those people and the people that crewed the tanks in the first place. By early November 1942, Short of fuel and weakened by five days of fighting at El Alamein, Rommel only had 35 serviceable tanks left. Montgomery came up with a plan codenamed Operation Supercharge that he believed would finish off the Desert Fox Rommel once and for all. A combined force of tanks, infantry and artillery would smash their way through enemy lines, destroying their tanks and supply routes. It worked. The German line is fractured, the armor pours through. By the 2nd of November, his tanks shot up and strafed by British planes, because British now have air superiority. Rommel realizes the game's up, he's gonna have to retreat. But of course, Hitler orders him not to give an inch. He has to stand and die, and it's typical Hitler command. He just thinks it's like some kind of medieval battle where you stand and hold your ground at the last man. Rommel ignores Hitler's command and begins a retreat. That retreat this time never stops. That retreat goes on till May 1943, when the Germans and the Italians finally surrender at Tunis, and the Desert War is over. Cyril Jolly, a British tank commander, wrote, As the sun rose, it was marvelous to see again the brigade spread out in open battle formation. With the plumes of sand billowing in the wake of each tank and vehicle, as we moved in a wide arc to cut off and encircle the enemy. It was a costly victory. A total on both sides of about 5,000 men were killed at El Alamein. It was a significant turning point in World War II. Before El Alamein, the Allies had never won a major victory. After El Alamein, they never suffered a major defeat. It was the tipping point of the war. A better supported and better equipped British force had finally made up for their humiliation in France. After three years of continuous defeat, of privation, of terror, of German invasion, finally, British armies had done what British armies always did in the past, had won a famous British victory. The pride of Germany's forces, Rommel and the Africa Corps, the best that Germany had, had been defeated by the British Eighth Army. The Desert Rats and their combat machines had ultimately triumphed over the elements and Rommel's army. In a straight-up stand-up fight, the British had finally been the last man left in the ring. And now, with American manpower and American armor, victory over the Third Reich was closer to becoming a reality. The 20th century saw the dawn of a new type of warfare. Machines ruled the battlefield. Conventional infantry assault across no man's land was bound to fail. Flesh and blood simply could not get through that type of defense. A fierce arms race led to even more deadly weapons. And those gunners on the tanks had rounds in their cannons, and they were ready to execute if they were told to. Behind the lines, the development of powerful and innovative vehicles meant the difference between victory and defeat. This is absolutely one of the unsung heroes of the Second World War. The relentless pursuit of military supremacy would lead to machines capable of destroying humanity itself. There are very few mistakes you could make.
that wouldn't have some kind of catastrophic consequence. This time, the fate of the greatest amphibious landing in history and the liberation of Europe depends on a collection of remarkable machines. Vehicles like this, while they may not get all of the glory of, say, a Sherman tank, they're significant in winning wars. Machines that were pushed to breaking point. With the Jeep, you could take it anywhere. You could drive it up mountains, you could take it in the desert, across fields, through rivers. It didn't matter, it kept going. The heroic exploits of their drivers were legendary. These guys look like they've stepped out of a movie. They come like knights in shining armory. They are the true liberators. They're like the knights of the round table, these guys. Day, June 6th, 1944. After nearly five years of war, the long planned for liberation of Europe from Nazi rule has arrived. Over 6,000 vessels transport troops and equipment across the channel from England towards the Normandy beaches in northern France. D-Day was the biggest ever amphibious operation mounted in history. The scale was truly breathtaking. By the end of the first day, a 50-mile beachhead had been secured. But victory in Europe depended on more than just a successful landing and first 24 hours. The need was to put something like 100,000 men ashore, virtually on day one, and then to continue the backup, the immense backup, of troops coming forward on day two, three, four, five, etc., to push the battle for Normandy forward. It was enormous. Britain, the United States, and their allies faced a formidable enemy. After D-Day, the Allied push towards Germany would test both troops and machines. There were a number of vehicles the Allies relied on to get men and munitions ashore for the push towards Berlin. This is an example of a combat machine which truly broke the mold. The DUKW, known affectionately by the GIs as the Duck. It has a trick up its sleeve. It's a two and a half ton truck that is just as happy at sea as it is on land. This ingenious vehicle was designed to overcome a problem that had plagued invading armies for centuries. The delivery of troops, and supplies to invasion beaches. This takes time and makes them vulnerable to enemy attack. This vehicle can drive off of a landing craft into the water, float to shore, driven by a propeller, and then when you get to shore, you switch it over to the wheel drive, so you don't have to deal with the process of taking things to the beach on a boat, unloading them, and then putting them on a truck to move inland. You can just drive ashore and continue on like any old truck. Which meant that the men were under fire for a much lesser period of time, and you can move them much more quickly. This amphibious truck was the brainchild of an American racing yacht designer named Rod Stevens. He took the chassis of a General Motors company truck and encased it in a steel hull. Powered by a six-cylinder engine, it can do 50 miles per hour on land and six knots in the water. It has a rudder and propeller at the rear, and the front wheels also help it steer. Watertight seals and thick grease keep any water out. Essentially, this vehicle needs very little preparation. Uh, once it's in the water, uh, working like a boat with the propeller spinning, uh, once you get to shore, all the operator has to do is shift a lever, basically, and it turns it into uh, a land-going vehicle. Uh, the propeller shaft is no longer spinning, and there's now drive to the wheels. In 1942, 
Rod Stevens and his team built a prototype in just over a month. It was given the code letters D, meaning 1942, U, meaning amphibian, K, denoting front wheel drive, and W, rear wheel drive. But Stevens' fast work was wasted. The US Army took little interest in this strange looking craft. Then in the spring of 1942, a US Coast Guard ship ran aground off Cape Cod. And it looked as though the ship and her crew were doomed. Until they turned for help to the DUKW. In just 10 minutes, the duck reached the stricken vessel, saving the lives of all on board. President Roosevelt himself got to hear of the rescue, and a large order for the ducks soon followed. 20,000 would be constructed between 1942 and 1945. The DUKW was first tested under fire in the Allied invasion of Sicily in July 1943, as American, Canadian and British forces attempted to force Italy out of the war. I think it's fair to say the DUKW performed very well indeed. It was ideal, it could, it could carry a couple of tons of supplies or 24 fully armed infantry. So it was a very good vehicle, it was very versatile. The Allies knew that D-Day would be a sterner test, but confidence amongst DUKW drivers was high. They gave us a sort of pep talk. They said we were going to invade France in the morning. I thought, so what? I drive in and out of the ocean hundreds of times. The DUKWs worked hard. In the early days of the D-Day invasion, they brought 40% of the 14,500 tons of supplies carried to the beaches each day. As soon as we hit the shore on D-Day, we were rushed into service. The fact that we hadn't had any sleep for more than 24 hours didn't matter. The combat troops were in dire need of food and ammunition. As the British, Canadian and American troops and their allies slowly advanced through Normandy, they faced a formidable enemy. The Germans would fight tooth and nail to hang on to what they had. They realized every yard the Allies covered was a yard nearer Berlin, so it was going to be a very, very tough fight indeed. The Nazi war machine would fight a fierce rearguard action, testing Allied ingenuity to its limits. In terms of the liberation of Europe, having vehicles which are easy maintained, plentiful, rugged and reliable was absolutely vital. The DUKWs had some innovative features to help them adapt to a range of terrain. They were expected to run on both sand and road, but this meant manually changing the tire pressures, placing the drivers in grave danger. So in late 1943, an ingenious tire inflation system was devised that could be operated from the driver's seat. A compressor powered by the engine fed all six tires. That meant the pressure could be adjusted without stopping. Even tires riddled with bullet holes could be kept inflated. As the Allies advanced, the DUKWs proved to be remarkably effective combat machines. When the Germans retreated, they blew up bridges over rivers and canals to hamper the Allied advance, but the DUKWs were able to cross the water with ease. Who needs bridges when the ducks are willing and able? Our tanks were penetrating deeper into Germany's soul by the hour, and race we did. A lot of attention uh, is given to um, the, the well-known systems, the tanks, the bombers, the, the fighter planes, and they're significant, always. But while the shooters get all of the glory, it's trucks and other equipment like this amphibious duck that allowed the military to continue uh, providing the supplies and indeed also uh, the, win the war, essentially, through materiel. So vehicles like this while they may not get all of the glory of, say, a Sherman tank, they're significant in winning wars.
To help the Allied armies succeed in their aim of pushing into Germany and ultimately securing victory, the troops the DUKW supplied needed a swift, light, tactical vehicle. It is an ideal all-terrain vehicle. It can be used as a weapons platform if mounted with machine guns. With the Jeep, you could take it anywhere. You could drive it up the mountains, you could take it in the desert, across fields, through rivers. It didn't matter, it kept going. This iconic vehicle would be tested in some of the toughest operations of the Second World War. In the summer of 1944, the fate of Europe depended on the Allied plan to land over 150,000 troops on the beaches of Normandy, and then race to Berlin to defeat Nazi Germany, getting there before the Soviets coming from the east. Success relied on the skill and courage of the troops and the quality of their machinery. Modern, fast-moving warfare meant that both sides needed a tactical vehicle that was lightweight and versatile. The Germans possessed one. This is the Kubelwagen. It began life as a peacetime vehicle, the best-selling people's car, or Volkswagen, designed in the early 1930s by the legendary Ferdinand Porsche. After a directive from the German army, Porsche took his famous design and turned it into a combat machine. Basically, it was a Volkswagen. Um, however, with a couple of modifications, higher suspension, so it had a, a higher land clearance, and also a more rugged chassis, as well as having a lower gearbox so that it could be driven both at walking pace and also to go at the highest speeds that the Volkswagen as well as the Kubelwagen were very well known to getting up to. A key element of the Kubelwagen's reinforced chassis was a single steel plate that formed the whole of its underside. Which was able to deflect, say for instance, rocks or pebbles going into the inside of the car. The main concept of that was basically to protect the vulnerable underside of the car, same way that you would do with a tank or even with a truck. In the summer of 1943, a captured Kubelwagen was taken to the United States for a series of tests. The Americans wanted to know if anything could be learned to improve their version of the machine. A vehicle that was beginning to make a name for itself on the battlefield. A vehicle that would become one of the most famous combat machines in history. The Jeep. By the time of D-Day, the Jeep was battle-proven, having been used in North Africa uh, and, and Italy. And one of the great things about the Jeep was that it was proven to be soldier-proof. Soldiers have a really nasty habit of breaking stuff, and that's the key to a good military design. It's got to be robust, utilitarian, and pretty much unbreakable. And the Jeep ticked all those boxes. Back in July 1940, the US Army had asked car manufacturers to come up with a design for a rugged four-wheel drive reconnaissance vehicle. A small company named Bantam won the bid and provided a working prototype in only 49 days. But their triumph was short-lived. Unfortunately, Bantam simply wasn't a big enough company to compete with the larger players. Uh, the design it came up with and the prototype it came up was ideal. Unfortunately, it just didn't have the wherewithal to produce them in large enough numbers. The manufacturing contracts for Bantam's Jeep went to two much larger American firms, Willys and Ford. US Army policy was never to name their vehicles, and so the trucks rolling off the production lines were simply known as the quarter-ton truck 4x4. Jeep was shorthand for GP, government purpose, the generic term for military vehicles in World War II. Although it had been used in the campaigns in North Africa and Italy, it was the liberation of Europe that would push the Jeep to its limit. 
with any military vehicle, it's gonna be able to function really well off-road. The minute it breaks down off-road, it's useless. With the Jeep, you could take it anywhere. You could drive it up the mountains, you could take it in the desert, across green fields, through plowed fields, through rivers, it didn't matter, it kept going. It can be used to pull the trailer, so you can fill a Jeep with kit, you can fill it with people. It can be used as a weapons platform if mounted with machine guns. So you can carry a lot of supply with a relatively small vehicle and over any bad ground that you choose. Jeeps were also used to lay smoke to deceive the enemy, to carry the wounded, to carry dignitaries visiting the battlefield, including King George VI and President Roosevelt. Jeeps even became communion tables in church services. And when movie stars were asked to promote US war bonds, the iconic Jeep was chosen to carry them. Back on the battlefields of France in the summer of 1944, the Jeep was in the thick of the action, often leading the charge. The newly formed British Special Air Service, the SAS, liked it because it was fast and its specially designed combat wheels still functioned even when the tires were deflated. The Jeep's headlights could be tilted up to illuminate the engine for urgent nighttime repairs. Following the D-Day landings, I mean, the Jeep remained what it was, a jack of all trades, uh, and was used for hit and run raids by the SAS, the Seas Bridges. They spent a lot of time supporting the French resistance, darting about France. Once again, the Jeep showed its versatility. For these raids, they wouldn't be driven into position, they would be flown in. Now, a Jeep, because it's compact, relatively light, fits very nicely into a glider. If your glider lands successfully, you open the doors, you roll the Jeep out, press the start the motor, and off you go. By August 1944, the Germans had lost control of most of Normandy. The SAS devised a plan to block enemy units, retreating through the so-called Paris-Orléans Gap. It was called Operation Wallace. The idea of Operation Wallace was to actually disrupt enemy communications and to support the resistance. This was highly successful, but the key to that mission was speed, and obviously the Jeep enabled them to bomb through what had been uh, effectively bandit territory in the face of the retreating Germans. And the sheer psychological factor of having swiftly moving vehicles behind their own lines which could easily be part of a much larger attack, was something which helped to unhinge the German defense. For weeks, the SAS wreaked havoc amongst enemy bases and troop convoys. The Royal Air Force were able to drop 12 new Jeeps to replace ones the SAS lost in battle. The Jeep became a vital resource in the next key campaign of World War II. By September 1944, the Allied armies were close to the German border. The Americans in the south and the British and Canadians to the north. British Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery pushed for airborne drops of paratroopers to secure bridges in Holland in an operation known as Market Garden. Immortalized in the classic British film, A Bridge Too Far. Once again, jeeps were to be dropped to assist the troops. The role of the jeep in this operation was quite interesting because it was the prime mover of the parachutists when they were on the ground. This use of the jeep by airborne forces was really intended to boost their functions, first to give them the capacity to transport their supply and to give them a reconnaissance capacity of the eyes and ears of your airborne force. The Jeep had a much bigger impact in the Second World War than it's often given credit for. It's one of those vehicles which was produced in huge numbers and could do almost anything. This was not an advantage enjoyed by the enemy. Their production of vehicles was nowhere near as great. And as a result, small unit mobility was often better with the Americans or the British than it was with their enemies. 
for the people of occupied Europe, there was one vehicle in particular that came to represent their hard-won freedom, often arriving even ahead of the jeeps. These guys look like they've stepped out of a movie. They are the true liberators. They're like the Knights of the Round Table, these guys. For one village in particular, a Harley Davidson and her rider would become a legendary hero. In the months after the D-Day invasion in June 1944, the Americans, Canadians, British and their allies had to fight hard to break out beyond the borders of Normandy and France. Hitler had told his troops in early July that every square kilometre must be defended tenaciously. It was a battle of attrition. The Germans had to be ground down. Slowly, village after village was liberated. One American GI wrote, To be 19 and fight for the liberation of France from the Nazis in the summer of 1944, at time of hot and cloudless blue days, when we shouted strange phrases in words we didn't understand, to men and women who cheered us as if we were gods, Racing ahead of the Allied tanks and troops were reconnaissance units on machines which, more than any other, came to symbolize the coming liberation. It was the first sight of freedom, the iconic Harley-Davidson WLA. In the uh, late 1930s, the uh, reconnaissance units of the United States Army were still heavily horse-related. But by the late 1930s, they wanted to mechanize those troops, and they were looking into uh, solutions to replace the horses by motor vehicles. The Army ordered some motorcycles from the different brands, such as Indian and Delco and Harley-Davidson, to test them and to see what they could, uh, could do. It was Harley-Davidson who had proved themselves to be one of the United States' most innovative motorcycle manufacturers who won the bidding war. Over 90,000 WLAs would be produced between 1942 and 1945. They were used for escort, courier, radio and reconnaissance duties. One of the strengths of the WLA was that it was reliable and easily maintained by the rider. The WLA is a very basic motorcycle um, based on a civilian model. It is equipped with a 750cc V-twin engine and it drives the gearbox through a primary chain on the left side and then the rear wheel through a secondary chain on the right side. Early Harley Davidsons had an inefficient oil system that meant the rider had to manually regulate the lubricant whilst riding. In the 1930s, a new, more dependable automatic oiling system was devised. Oil from a tank beside the fuel tank was circulated through the engine via an oil pump. Oil was then pumped up to the oil tank for recirculation. This so-called dry sump system gave the WLAs a longer operational life. Although the engine was world class, the WLA was a tough bike to master. It has brake on the right side and foot clutch on the left side, so it has no clutch on the handlebars. You change gears with by hand on the left side of the tank. You have throttle on the right and ignition spark advance on the left. So it is really fairly complicated to ride if you are not used to it. But the Harley riders loved their bikes, as they were reliable, easily maintained and well kitted out for combat with blackout lights, a gun rack for a rifle or submachine gun, and an ammunition box and large luggage rack with leather saddlebags. The German army had their own hard-working motorbike, the BMW R75. It was designed for a direct combat role. never see a motorcycle 
or any kind of motorcycle units being employed in such large numbers as the Germans did. The BMW R75 was powered by a 750cc side valve engine that gave it a top speed of 59 miles per hour. The motorcycle was designed to carry three men, one machine gun and two riflemen. Each motorcycle in a squad of, say for instance, 10 motorcycles, that would be a platoon worth of 30 men who are very heavily armed. They would have been able to give suppressive fire and be able to get in and out of tricky situations if needs be. So they converted their bikes into, if you like, mini Jeeps in a way. There were two wheel drive Jeeps, and I think there was a drive through the sidecar as well. And these, of course, they were fast, they were versatile, and they were very good for the reconnaissance role. And they were also armored. So they used their bikes, perhaps, should we say, rather more aggressively. As the US Army advanced through Europe in the summer and autumn of 1944, the Harley WLA took on a new, vital and dangerous role. Motorcycle scouts at the head of advancing army columns, and not as well armed as their German counterparts, were given the task of seeking out enemy positions and radioing back with urgent intel. Obviously, if you're advancing, even if the enemy's retreating, you have to assume that he may well have left a rear guard in any defended area, or certainly he may well have booby-trapped. The Germans are very good at booby-trapping the area. So you always have to make sure you have reconnaissance forces in place first before you bring the rest of your armoured formations up, just so the enemy hasn't sprung any surprises. The motorcycle scouts were often the first Allied soldiers the French and Belgian civilians saw. The GI's distinctive bikes soon acquired a nickname, the Liberator. One American in particular became a folk hero for the people of Belgium. His name was 21-year-old James Carroll, a scout with the 628th Tank Destroyers Battalion. At the eve of the 3rd of September, they were in the woods at Condé, a small village on the French-Belgian border. Carroll's commanding officer sent him into Belgium to see what was going on, if there were still German troops uh, in the villages. And Carroll crossed the border on his Harley Davidson and he took the main road into Perue. Perue was a small Belgian town that had been under Nazi occupation for four harsh years. <laughs> On the morning of the 3rd of September, 1944, James Carroll cautiously made his way into Peraway and parked his bike close to the town's church. He spoke to the priest who told him that the Germans were in the process of moving out. Oui, les Allemands fuyaient, repartaient vers l'Allemagne. C'était leur but, c'était de fuir. As carefully as he could, Carroll then headed out of the town to get help. He returned shortly after with a unit from the French resistance. News of the young GI's arrival soon spread. J'étais chez moi, mes parents. Et quand j'ai entendu les cloches cesser à se débrouiller, et on a crié que les, les Américains arrivaient, alors tout le monde était en folie, vraiment. Les, les Américains sont arrivés très calmement sur sa Harley Davidson. Tout le monde l'a félicité, l'a embrassé. C'était merveilleux. Pierre Dupré is a local historian fascinated by James Carroll's story. Donc voici la photo de la Grand Place. Comme vous le voyez, James est fleuri et la petite fille l'accueille 
au nom de tous les habitants. Ensuite, il a refait demi-tour parce qu'il était en observation et il est allé annoncer à, au Tank Destroyer que Pérou était libéré, qu'il n'y avait plus d'Allemands. These guys look like they've stepped out of a movie. They are driving these becoming iconic vehicles. They have so much of everything. They have so many rations. They have chocolate. They have cigarettes. They've got nylons. They come like knights in shining armor. It's a romantic view. They are the true liberators. They're like the knights of the round table, these guys. Perouet never forgot James Carroll and his motorbike and was sad when they'd heard he'd been killed a few weeks later. Pierre Desprez was determined to find Carol's final resting place so they could honor their first American. Alors je me suis promis de le retrouver ce premier américain soit dans un cimetière ou soit vivant aux États-Unis. Donc nous avons essayé par la par l'intermédiaire des les associations de vétérans américains de la Deuxième Guerre mondiale de retrouver notre premier américain. But the village discovered to their delight that James Carroll had survived the war and was very much alive. Donc c'est Colette, mon épouse, qui a décroché le téléphone et qui a entendu James lui dire « It's me, I'm, I'm still alive ». On s'est regardé. On s'est dit que c'était vraiment génial d'avoir qu'il qu était encore vivant. Et alors on s'est demandé, tiens, comment peut-on l'honorer Et la meilleure façon, c'était de faire une fête et de l'inviter. So in 1995, almost 50 years after he first arrived, he returned once more to Paraguay as their special guest. Quand j'ai rêvé, effectivement, on nous a... On a dit plusieurs, mais... Nous étions des anciens combattants. Et bien sûr, ça nous a remémoré tout ce qu'il a fait. C'est vraiment héroïque. Beaucoup de gens étaient là, surtout pour voir le vétéran. Et nous avions à l'époque uniquement un convoi de véhicules américains, anglais. James Carroll returned to Paraguay every September for the next five years. Ben disons, moi je le considère un peu comme, un, comme le grand-père de la famille. Hein. Il faisait partie de la famille. Et alors je me souviens toujours la dernière fois qu'il est venu. Il avait, disons, chaque fois qu'il revenait, chaque fois en uniforme. Et puis je le vois encore sa valise ouverte en me disant Je ne saurais pas le mettre, je vais te le laisser. Donc il nous a laissé son uniforme en se, en se doutant très bien qu'il ne reviendrait plus. En hein. juin 2005, James Carroll passed away at his home in America. Four years later, a statue was erected by the grateful people of Belgium in tribute to all the Harley bike riders who liberated them in the months after D-Day. Their exploits and their iconic machines will never be forgotten. As the Allied armies moved across France and Belgium in 1944, the Liberator was a key part of that success. But that success posed a problem, a lack of supplies of food and equipment. And so a solution was devised, a rolling convoy system that became the stuff of legend. The British, Canadian and American troops and their allies, who fought hard to liberate Europe in 1944 and 45, relied on a series of remarkable machines. From the DUKW amphibious vehicle to the Jeep and the Harley-Davidson WLA. Supporting them was an unsung hero, a vehicle that would help the Allies solve a problem of their own making. In the weeks leading up to D-Day, the French railway network had been repeatedly attacked by the British and Americans. Although this had hindered German attempts to defend the beaches, it left a huge logistical problem for the Allies. How to supply their troops, especially because the channel ports were still under German control. When you're waging industrial war, and when you just stage a very successful amphibious operation, but you're pushing out at what is effectively enemy-held territory, logistics are absolutely vital. Without supply, the army just stops. 
At the end of August 1944, as the Allied forces pushed even deeper into France, an ingenious plan was devised to create a rolling convoy system nicknamed the Red Ball Express. The Red Ball Express is one of the most innovative supply solutions of all time. As the Allies moved north through France, away from the Normandy beachheads, as the supplies kept coming in, 6,000 trucks, mainly American trucks, were used on a vast one-way system. You've got to bring the food for the troops and the medical supplies, and you've got to take back the wounded. And the Red Ball Express essentially kept a 24-hour-a-day, seven-day-a-week highway going from the invasion front, which had been Normandy, uh, up to the, the front lines, and which were getting further and further from the beaches of Normandy as the war progressed uh, through 1944 and into 1945. The Red Ball Express was named after a famous 19th century fast freight service on the Santa Fe Railroad in New Mexico. The backbone of the 1944 version was this US Army vehicle, the two and a half ton cargo truck nicknamed the Jimmy. Powered by a 90 horsepower engine that gave it a top speed of 50 miles per hour. It could cross water almost three feet deep and climb a 65 degree slope. And they were more than just workhorses. If required, the Red Bull trucks could take a direct combat role. Uh, in some cases, if they're working close to the front where they might encounter enemy fire or uh, run into pockets of resistance, uh, they could actually mount a machine gun on this truck with a ring over the driver's and uh, co-driver's cab. At their peak, these trucks were supplying 28 Allied divisions with 12,500 tons of food, fuel and equipment a day. In October 1944, American General Dwight D. Eisenhower, the Allied Supreme Commander, wrote to encourage officers and men of the Red Ball Express, You are doing an excellent job, but the struggle is not yet won. So the Red Ball Line must continue the battle it is waging so well, with the knowledge that each truckload which goes through to the combat forces cannot help but bring victory closer. This truck is not only an important part of America's military history, it's an important part of its social history too. Most of the drivers on the Red Ball Express were African American. Their vital role has been overlooked for decades. At the time, very few African Americans were allowed to serve in the fighting units. So it, it was particularly significant that their contribution to the war was so great, even though they don't get the recognition that a lot of the troops at the front lines and the fighting troops got. You can essentially credit victory in, in no small part to their work as well. Uh, they were a significant part of the logistical supply of an advancing Allied army. The driver's work was hard and full of risk. Red Bull convoys were quite dangerous simply because they were quite often traveling through territory where mines had not been cleared, there were still pockets of German resistance, they could get strafed, and also in the name of getting supplies through, these things ran 24 hours a day pretty much, which meant the drivers were very tired and accidents were quite common. But if it was dangerous for the Allied supply vehicles, for the Germans under heavy bombardment, it was often a suicide mission. The backbone of their supply network was a truck that didn't come from the factories of Germany, but the factories of France. After France surrendered in June 1940, over 6,000 of these Citroen U-23 trucks were commandeered by the German army. They were badly needed. There's this stereotypical view of the Germans going into the Second World War fully prepared to go up against the Allies, and it was simply not the case. You see many cases of the Germans using vehicles from Skoda, Citroen, and other foreign nations to 
bolster their own war effort against these nations and their allies. The French had used these Citroens as supply vehicles, as ambulances and radio cars. But the Germans saw they had greater potential. After the occupation of France, the first thing that they did was they improved the chassis, they reinforced the chassis and improved the brakes. They gave it hydraulic brakes, which basically made the Citroen U23 more reliable. And also it made its total laden weight up to a massive four tons compared to how it was back before the modifications of 1.5 tons. The Citroen was now capable of carrying almost twice as much as its Red Bull rival, the Jimmy. But the German policy of using other nations' transport for their war effort had a dangerous flaw. The result was a wide variety of vehicles, each with different maintenance schedules and requiring different parts. Whereas Red Bull trucks like the Jimmy, produced in their thousands, were entirely standardised and reliable. The Germans realized too late the need to standardize their trucks. By 1944, Allied attacks made it impossible. And their vehicles had a further weakness. The Germans had a tendency to overcomplicate their engineering. Their engineering was brilliant, but in many ways it was more sophisticated, too sophisticated for the job in hand. By November 16th, 1944, the French railways had been repaired and channel ports were open along the Allied line of advance. The decision was taken to finally halt the Red Bull convoys. By then, the two and a half ton truck had proved itself to be one of the most significant machines of the conflict. US General Patton described it as their most important weapon. This is absolutely one of the unsung heroes of the Second World War. We give so much credit to the tanks and the fighter planes and the bombers, but trucks like this allow mechanized warfare to move forward, and they're an essential part of the battle. Victory in Europe finally came in May 1945. It was achieved by a combination of heroism, superior firepower, and machines that proved to be fit for purpose skilled at fast reconnaissance, pioneering, strong, and versatile. In those hard-fought months after D-Day, these groundbreaking machines, designed and built at speed, became symbols of liberation for millions and secured themselves a lasting legacy. The 20th century saw the dawn of a new type of warfare, Machines ruled the battlefield. Conventional infantry assault across no man's land was bound to fail. Flesh and blood simply could not get through that type of defense. A fierce arms race led to even more deadly weapons. And those gunners on the tanks had rounds in their cannons and they were ready to execute if they were told to. Behind the lines, the development of powerful and innovative vehicles meant the difference between victory and defeat. This is absolutely one of the unsung heroes of the Second World War. The relentless pursuit of military supremacy would lead to machines capable of destroying humanity itself. There are very few mistakes you could make that wouldn't have some kind of catastrophic consequence. This time, intricate combat machines built for the shadowy world of spies, deception, and trickery. So these are the generals sending messages to and from Hitler. If you can read these messages, you potentially you're going to get into the mind of what Hitler is planning to do. Machines capable of stealing secrets from under the noses of the enemy. From a military perspective, it was an unprecedented intelligence coup. Machines whose secrets were a matter of life or death. If you were taken alive in the first place, you would then be simply tortured to reveal as much information as possible and then taken outside and shot.
20th century was an era of rapid technological advances. One of the most significant inventions was radio. It changed the lives of millions forever and also the nature of warfare. The invention of radio communication transformed war exponentially and it meant that the man in the front line could now communicate directly with the man in the rear line. You dial at the radio, you're speaking to the gunner and his shells are gonna start falling in the next 30 seconds. By the outbreak of World War II, it was clear radio had another use, as a vital tool in the shadowy world of espionage and counterintelligence. For one British secret organization formed in July 1940, radio became a key part of their covert fight against the Germans in occupied Europe. Their name was Special Operations Executive, or SOE. Prime Minister Winston Churchill gave SOE their orders to set Europe ablaze. After 1940, he wanted a means of taking the fight to the enemy, which meant effectively clandestine operations. We couldn't fight them on any conventional battlefield, but what we could do was stoke the fires of resistance in Europe and attack the Germans effectively from within. SOE agents were recruited from all walks of life, from chefs to electricians, and trained in Scotland and at the secluded country estate of Bewley in Hampshire, in the south of England. One of the key tools of SOE agents was radio communication. Radio was their lifeline to base. It was the wireless that was the principal instantaneous method of communication. It's your link to life and death. During the Second World War, radios were used by both the Germans and the Allies to transmit vital coded information. They knew that the intelligence sent by these combat machines could affect the outcome of the conflict. The radios used by uh, SOE were normally quite small, a uh, small suitcase, a small attaché case, uh, or a backpack type uh, arrangement, and normally comprised a receiver, a transmitter, a uh, power supply, which could either run off whatever AC was available in the country they were in, or DC from a car battery or similar. And with that, in the code book, you would uh, code your message. The radio operator would uh, then send in Morse code. But it was a dangerous job. The life expectancy of an SOE agent in France was only six weeks. The consequences of being found with a radio transmitter during the Second World War were quite simple. Um, if you were taken alive in the first place, you would then be simply tortured to reveal as much information as possible and then taken outside and shot. As the war progressed, so vital and yet so perilous had SOE's role become, it was thought that female agents stood the best chance of carrying out missions behind enemy lines without being detected. One of SOE's 60 female agents was a 22-year-old named Yvonne Baisden, codenamed Odette. Yvonne had two months training at Bewley and then on the 18th of March, 1944, was parachuted into France. Her mission was to assist the French resistance near Toulouse in the run-up to D-Day, the invasion of Europe. Yvonne had the vital job of wireless operator for the resistance cell. The wireless operator in communication with London can enable parachute drops of supplies, um, can bring in more people, uh, and is absolutely key. The Germans had perfected an ingenious way to detect enemy agents who were using radio transmitters powered by mains electricity. By They would turn the power off block by block in the city until the radio transmission went off, and then so that obviously they would know which block you were in. We countered that by fitting the radio with a power supply which would also work off a battery at the flick of a switch. The Germans think that you are not in that building, they've just turned the power off, and luckily they look elsewhere. In France, Yvonne trained French resistance fighters how to set explosive charges. And by using coded radio messages, organized parachute drops of weapons. 
One successful drop on the 16th of July 1944 involved over 400 tonnes of armaments. That so many canisters of supplies were dropped is testament to her role as a wireless operator. But then the next day, disaster. As Yvonne and the resistance cell were celebrating the successful mission, the building was surrounded by German soldiers. Some of the resistance were shot, the rest were captured. Yvonne was tortured, but managed to keep her identity secret. The Allied Supreme Commander, General Eisenhower, paid tribute to those in France who fought German occupation. After the war, Eisenhower suggested that the French resistance contributed to shortening the war by up to nine months. The work of the various groups around D-Day in harassing German soldiers and delaying their travel up to the Normandy beachhead meant that Allied servicemen were able to get a foothold in France and it saved many lives as a result. Yvonne Baisden survived the war and was honored by both the British and French governments for her bravery. As Yvonne Baisden worked undercover in France, a spy in London was transmitting urgent radio messages to German intelligence from the heart of the British government. But all was not what it seemed. In the spring of 1944, the Germans knew that British, American, Canadian and French troops were massing in the south of England. An invasion of Europe was clearly imminent. So the big issue really is when is the invasion going to take place and where is it going to take place? The fact that the invasion was coming was no big secret. An Allied plan was devised to trick the Germans, to make them believe the invasion wouldn't be in Normandy, but further east. The plan was christened Operation Fortitude. And the main part of the Fortitude plan was actually to mislead the Germans into thinking that the invasion of Europe would fall on the Pas de Calais. This was quite clever because the Pas de Calais had actually been considered as a potential landing zone. In one of the most bizarre twists of the Second World War, British intelligence believed that a former chicken farmer with a radio transmitter should be a major part of the fortitude deception. His name was Juan Pujol, a Catalan who believed the Nazis were destroying Europe. To fool the Germans, he conjured up a network of fictitious agents around Britain, who he claimed were providing him with valuable intelligence. From the roof of MI5's headquarters in St. James Street, Pujol transmitted their reports using a captured German spy radio. The Germans came to trust Juan Pujol because of his results and they came to the conclusion that he was the best agent with the best communications. And so the Germans came to not only believe in Pujol, but to rely upon him. Ben Nock has a radio similar to the one Pujol would have used. One of the German spy sets in my collection unusually has all the controls with English lettering. My only assumption there being that if anybody was poking into it, being nosy, they would open the suitcase, see the English writing, and not think twice. But D-Day posed a problem for the double agent. For weeks, Pujol had been telling German intelligence the Allies weren't ready to invade in June. When D-Day happened, he would be shown to be wrong, and therefore not to be trusted. It was decided that at the last minute, Pujol would tip the Germans off. At 3 a.m. on the morning of the 6th of June, Pujol radioed a coded message. Three days ago, cold rations and vomit bags had been distributed to troops of the 3rd Canadian Division, and that the division had left camp, its place now taken by Americans. This could only mean one thing to the Germans, invasion. The vomit bags suggesting a sea journey was a clever touch. But Pujol also said in his message that the attack was a trap to make us move our reserves. 
The real invasion was elsewhere. It was to put across the deception that this was a diversionary feint and that the real attack was going to take place a couple of weeks later in the Pas de Calais. There is, in fact, concrete evidence that the deception worked. German tactics changed on D-Day. And that's why the 1st SS Panzer Division, which started to move down to Normandy when the beachhead was established, was turned back, stopped in its tracks, and sent back to the Franco-Belgian border in anticipation of the real attack, which was going to take place, of course, in the Pas de Calais. The Germans never suspected Pujol was a double agent. On the 29th of July, 1944, he received an extraordinary message from German intelligence. Hitler was awarding him the Iron Cross for his courageous work. Juan Pujol and his radio transmitter made a significant difference to the outcome of the invasion of Europe. It's hard to exaggerate the contribution that Juan Pujol made to the successful prosecution of the D-Day landings and indeed of the Second World War. He certainly saved tens of thousands of lives. As Juan Pujol played his D-Day trick, 30 miles north of London, a combat machine unlike any other on Earth was hard at work. Deciphering orders from Hitler himself. In time of war, the flow of radio information is constant and vital. It can mean the difference between victory and defeat. It has to remain secure. Messages are often sent in code to ensure total secrecy. But codes can be cracked if you have a high-tech combat machine. Code making and code breaking go hand in hand. You make codes so that your messages are kept secret, but if you want to know what the enemy is doing, you have to break those codes, and many of them are broken. In the 1930s, the Germans developed a cipher machine that they believed could produce messages that would be impossible to decode. This is Enigma, the most famous cipher machine of them all. And for good reason. It was an ingenious device. The plug board and the settings of the rotors were designed by the Germans to produce 150 million, million, million possible combinations. Every 90 days, the Germans would send out under armed guard a key list. And the key list would say which rotors to use, which order the rotors were going to be in, what the settings of those rotors would be, which numbers, this machine has numbers, some had letters, and what the plug board setting would be. Now this machine did not send the message. It only encrypted and decrypted. The message are sent through the radio. The Germans know it's intercepted, but they're not concerned because they don't think anyone can read Enigma. At the height of the Second World War, about 20,000 Enigma machines were used by the German army and navy. They were fairly simple to operate. So let's pretend it's December 7th, 1944. And the settings today are 26, 4, 1. We're going to send a short message from Berlin to Stuttgart. So Berlin encrypts a message. As the Berlin operator types hello, Enigma encrypts the letters, producing F, W, C, Z, R. Now, it's sent from the radio, and the Germans know it's intercepted, but are not concerned again because they're not aware anyone's reading Enigma. The Stuttgart operator receives the message. Then, using an Enigma machine with the same settings, 2641, types in F, W, Z, C, R, and gets the original pre-encrypted message, hello. Despite what the Germans believed, Enigma was vulnerable. Two British mathematicians, Alan Turing and Gordon Welchman, based at the British Centre for Codebreakers at Bletchley Park, north of London, built an electromechanical machine known as a bomber to attack the Enigma code. By mid-1940, the British were able to read vital German naval signals. 
As the British were decoding Enigma, the Germans were developing another, more sophisticated cipher machine. A machine to be used by Hitler himself to communicate with his battle commanders. It would make Enigma look like child's play. Enigma was effective, but had its limitations. It could only be used to send short messages. The German high command, they need to send reports to and from Hitler. These are big reports, well over 100 characters. And in actual fact, there was one message that was reported to be over 60,000 characters long. You cannot send that by Morse code. There needs to be another method. In 1941, the German electrical company Lorenz designed a cipher machine that could encrypt rapid teleprinter traffic, the Lorenz SZ42. So now you've got high-speed communication going on that is encrypted, very complex, much more complex than the Enigma, and it can cope with very, very large messages. If you can read these messages, you potentially you're going to get into the mind of what Hitler is planning to do. The British had no idea that Lorenz existed. Then, in the summer of 1941, an intercept station in London was listening out for spy transmissions coming out of Europe. They started to pick up high-speed German teleprinter traffic and then got a surprise. They connected that radio equipment into teleprinters and they were able to read the plain text message. But very soon afterwards, it went into encrypted mode. And at that point, they realized that there must be a machine that the Germans had developed that would encrypt teleprinter traffic. But at that point, they had no idea what the machine looked like. They had no idea of who manufactured it. The Germans believed that their complex combat machine couldn't possibly be broken. The Lorenz may have had no weaknesses, but its operators certainly did. On the 30th of August 1941, a German operator in Athens sent a 4,000 character message to a colleague in Salzburg, twice, without changing the 12-wheel settings of the Lorenz. The British had been listening in. For the codebreakers at Bletchley Park, these two messages were a gold mine. They were successfully decoded. But if they were to read other teleprinter messages, they had to find out how the German cipher machine worked. The Athens messages were given to a 24-year-old British mathematician named Bill Tutt. And he strips that string of characters down into pure bit patterns. And he starts to see the repeated patterns caused by the wheels rotating. Three months' work, the outcome is that he has worked out the complete architecture of the Lorenz SZ42. And even at that point, they still have no idea the name of this machine. The analysts and decoders who worked at Bletchley Park are probably the most eclectic bunch of individuals Britain has ever brought together. They did it with such brilliance such breathtaking capacity for innovation and for lateral thought. And this pooling of this massive IQ of brain power was unequaled in history. The work at Bletchley Park was laborious. One single Lorenz message could take up to six weeks to decode by hand. But then in January 1944, the future arrived at Bletchley the world's first programmable electronic computer, Colossus. Colossus was built primarily to do a statistical attack on the Lorenz cipher, to tease out the starting position of the 12 wheels of the Lorenz that the operator set the machine to when he sent the message. The cipher message was fed into Colossus via paper tape and the computer's 2,500 valves set to work finding the Lorenz's wheel settings. This is a fully functioning replica of Colossus at Bletchley Park, 
built according to the plans of its brilliant young designer, Tommy Flowers. The original Colossus was built by Flowers and his team in only 10 months. What used to take the cryptographers six weeks to decode was done in four hours. The British were reading Lorenz's messages sent by Hitler, sometimes even before his generals. The secret of the computer was its 2,500 valves. The valves on Colossus does all the processing. It's the heart of the machine. It processes data at high speed, and the only way you can do that is to use electronics. In those days, electronics was valves. By the end of the war, Bletchley Park had 10 Colossus computers. It's estimated that 63 million characters of German communications had been decrypted by May 1945. Colossus remained a secret until the mid-1970s. This rebuilt Colossus is, in part, a tribute to the men and women who operated the groundbreaking computer, many of whom died before their significant contribution to the war effort could be recognised. On the other side of the world, as the United States fought the Japanese in the Pacific, another code-breaking battle was taking place, combining modern technology and an ancient language. On the Second World War battlefields between 1941 and 1945, the US Army went to great lengths to maintain security. Their radio operators were given the latest combat equipment, but some units had a secret weapon from among their own ranks. As the Americans fought their way across the Pacific towards Japan, they soon discovered their enemy was skilled both in battle and in cryptography, breaking English language-based codes almost at will. But what if the codes weren't transmitted in American English, but instead in the indigenous language of the United States, Native American? The reason why Native American tribal languages were so good for secure communications is they were very secluded. Only those tribal nations understood their particular language, and there was a variety of them, and sometimes even within that language there were different dialects. Of all the Native American languages, Navajo is one of the hardest to understand. So in 1942, the U.S. Marine Corps took on 29 Navajo recruits to operate its radio equipment. If you don't hear it as an infant, you will not learn to speak it properly. It has the quality of tonal inflections, changing the meaning of a word entirely, which we don't really have a corresponding association with in English. And that's one of the reasons Marine Corps went with it. They knew no one else would ever learn it. George Nez was one of the first to enlist. I really enjoyed, you know, to protect our country. There's a lot of Navajos that joined the Marine Corps. My group that went in was called the First Original 29. These were the legendary code talkers. The Navajo radio operators used standard radio equipment to contact each other. However, they took steps to make their messages even harder to decipher. Translating messages from English to Navajo wasn't enough. They developed their own battlefield code words for combat machines and combat weapons. In Navajo, a bomber was a buzzard. Eggs were bombs. Potatoes were hand grenades. It's the same size and the same shape. Sharks were destroyers, the ship destroyers. Whales were battleships. On the land, we have uh, tortoises, which were tanks. They're slow, they're green, they have a hard shell. It was very easy to learn our codes. One guy would crank up the batteries and the other guy used a microphone to send message. The first message that I sent in the battlefield was, it went like this. Japanese machine gunners on your right flank destroy. And in a code I said, not all the bad don't have to the cut. 
The code talkers proved themselves to be fast and accurate, even in the midst of one of the bloodiest battles of the Pacific War. At the Battle of Iwo Jima, there were six Navajo code talkers over the course of 48 hours sent 600 coded messages and didn't have a single mistake. You couldn't say that using machine encryption systems. Those took time. You would have to encrypt the message, take it to the radio room, it would be sent out in Morse code. At the other end, they'd have to write it down, go back to their encryption system to decrypt it, and it would take significantly longer. The Japanese found it impossible to decode the Native Americans' messages. They resorted to desperate measures. So they did put a high priority on capturing a Navajo and forcing him to translate. And that's one of the reasons why many of the Navajo code talkers had personal bodyguards to protect them from being captured. But none of them were ever captured and the code remained secure. The war in the Pacific ended in September 1945. But the celebrations were short-lived. Within a year, suspicion and hostility between the Soviet Union and the West turned into a new world conflict, the Cold War. Vast sums were spent by both sides on weapon technology, but also on ways of stealing the secrets of that technology. The intelligence collection process was the coalface of the conflict, that in order to avoid a hot war, you collected intelligence in order to make certain that troops were not deployed unexpectedly, that there was not a surprise attack. From the early 1950s, the Royal Navy base at Portland on the south coast of England was a significant center for underwater warfare research. It was therefore of great interest to the Soviets who had an aging underwater fleet. The Soviets were very well aware of Anglo-American technology and they were anxious to steal secrets and to monitor developments in submarine warfare and technology. They were particularly interested in a British submarine sonar system called the Type 2001. Enter Harry Houghton, a British civil servant who was also a Russian spy. In 1956, together with his lover, Ethel G., who also worked at the Portland base, Houghton began to steal vital naval secrets. G. collected documents that she had access to. She had access to the registry and the drawing office. She then gave those to Harry Houghton, who photographed them on 35mm film. And then once a month, usually the first Saturday of the month, Harry Houghton, sometimes accompanied by Ethel G, would travel up to London. There they met a Soviet spy called Gordon Lonsdale, who passed on the secrets to the final link in the spy ring, a middle-aged American couple called Helen and Peter Kroger. Living in an unassuming house in the West London suburb of Ryslip, who had the perfect cover story. To all intents and purposes to their neighbours, it was thought that they were uh, an unmarried couple running this second-hand book business from an office in the Strand in London. This Soviet spy ring in the heart of Britain had the latest intelligence technology at their disposal to obtain classified information and get it back to Moscow. The most reliable method was to turn photographs into tiny images known as microdots. Perhaps the best known camera that was involved with uh, microdot production was the Minox camera. It had a very good lens on it, and importantly, from the microdot perspective, it produced a negative that was just 8 by 11 millimeters. And then using a, a fairly complex optical system, that then was reduced down by 100 or more times from the original size to a literally a, a fraction of a size, a, literally a full stop on a page. And then that microdot, that piece of film which contained all of that really important, valuable information, would then be either affixed to a letter, into a book, and then it was literally invisible to anyone that didn't know or wasn't expecting it. Popular places are underneath a stamp on the outside of an envelope 
or inside a letter that has been uh, written or typed and perhaps just simply placed directly over a full stop. And unless you know where to look, it's virtually impossible to find it. Then, through a complex optical system, the image is enlarged back to a size where the information can be transcribed or turned into another photograph. In 1960, the British security service, MI5, became suspicious of Harry Houghton. He seemed to have more wealth than a humble civil servant should have. MI5's surveillance of Houghton led them to Gordon Lonsdale and then to the Krogers in Ryslip. On the 7th of January 1961, the entire spy ring was arrested by special branch detectives. As they searched the Kroger's house, it slowly revealed its secrets. A radio to transmit to Russia, their dark room where the microdots were made, as well as cameras and spy equipment hidden in everyday objects. The Portland spy ring were all jailed for their treachery. But it was too late. The Soviets had got what they wanted most. Intel on the British sonar system, the Type 2001. And in 1967, the first Soviet nuclear-powered submarine was launched. It had a particular sonar system that was almost identical to the Type 2001, so they were able to cut a great deal of corners by using British technology to virtually copy the Type 2001 sonar. But the West would have its revenge, an audacious mission to listen in on Cold War secrets right under the noses of the Russians. This is one of the world's leading diving centers, based at Fort William in Scotland. Here, they use underwater technology pioneered in the Cold War. Versatile machines like these were once used in covert combat situations to steal enemy secrets. One top secret mission has become legendary for its bravery and audacity. It allowed the United States to listen in to the secret conversations of the Soviet Union just miles from the Russian coastline. In the early 1970s, the United States suspected that a crucial communication cable lay on the bottom of the Sea of Okhotsk, between the large Petropavlovsk submarine base and the Russian mainland, going all the way to Moscow. If the cable could somehow be tapped, the US would be able to intercept vital intel on sub and missile technology. How could a single cable be found in over a million square kilometers of water? One of the US Navy's most experienced naval intelligence officers, Captain James F. Bradley Jr., had an idea. He was out on a weekend with his son in a small outboard boat, and he happened to notice there was a sign that said, don't anchor here, underwater cables. He said, you know, we have those because we don't want people to drag up the cables, and the Soviets have underwater cables, and they got signs, probably in Russian, that say, don't anchor here, underwater cables. What if we could somehow get down there and tap into those cables? What kind of intelligence could we derive from that? Even if the US Navy could find the cable, how could they get a tap on it 200 meters down? A new technique called saturation diving held the key. On land, humans breathe about 80% nitrogen and 20% oxygen. For saturation diving, some of the oxygen and all of the nitrogen is replaced with helium, which is non-toxic. The benefits of saturation diving is that the diver can stay down at any given depth for much longer, for days, weeks if needed, and then decompress just once at the end of that. It's a long decompression, but it's a safe decompression. You 
you go down, you could go down to 30 meters, 40 meters, 100 meters, 200 meters, 300 meters, and then you stay there because your body takes on the gas at that pressure and it becomes saturated to a point where it can't take any more on. So you can then stay down there for as long as needed and then decompress very slowly, you just decompress once. The US Navy's mission to tap the Soviet cable was christened Operation Ivy Bells, and it was decided the nuclear submarine USS Halibut would carry the divers to the target area. Halibut was chosen because in her bow she had a large hangar nicknamed the Bat Cave. The Bat Cave became nothing more than a very large open space in the submarine where we could put a UNIVAC computer and other equipment and men who were monitoring what was going on in the water. On the halibut's stern was attached a decompression chamber needed to get the saturation divers ready to work underwater. It was so conspicuous, the Navy pretended it was an underwater rescue vehicle. The infrastructure that it took and the research and the preparation and the training and the cost was very much the equivalent of going to the moon for the first time. In October 1971, the USS Halibut arrived in the Sea of Okhotsk and began to search the shoreline at periscope depth for the sign warning of underwater cables that Captain Bradley believed had to be there. After a week, they spotted one. To find the cable in the murky waters, the Halibut deployed from its bat cave a remotely operated underwater vehicle known as an ROV, nicknamed the Fish. The Fort William Diving Center has its own 21st century version of the Halibut's ROV. Okay, this system here, this is the CI Falcon ROV, probably pretty similar to the Ivy Bell's Fish ROV. It consists of in this case, we have five thruster units, four horizontal, one vertical thruster. These are electric. The single camera, which can either be a color camera or a low light black and white, depending on configuration. We have a mechanical scanning sonar system. And at the front here, a single function uh, grabber, where we can use that to pick up little cables or rods from the seabed. Once the Halibut's divers located the cable with their ROV, the saturation divers entered the decompression chamber at the substern, breathing the helium and oxygen mixture. After a few hours, they were ready to join the ROV in the freezing water. The Halibut's divers and crew were well aware of the danger of discovery. These were enemy waters, and they were constantly patrolled. The Soviets had a couple of submarines out there. Now, these were older submarines. They were diesel powered, which meant that they couldn't spend an awful lot of time underwater, but they were very quiet, and they had sensitive sonars, and they're listening for any kind of sound that anything down there might make, which put us in a position of having to be very, very quiet all the time. You don't drop a wrench on the deck. You don't drop a spoon on the table. Everything you do is whisper quiet. Once the divers had located the cable, the listening device had to be installed. The cable couldn't be cut open. That would alert the Soviets. So a 16-foot wiretap that worked through induction was attached. Literally listening in. It was known as the pod. The whole purpose of Ivy Bells, when you strip away all the adventure and all of the excitement and all of the research, was intelligence. Exactly like a detective taps into a perp's telephone line, that's what we were doing. Because you have electricity with built-in intelligence moving through the cable, it produces a magnetic field, and this pod was able to pick up that magnetic field and pull the intelligence out of it and then record it. And back then, believe it or not, it was tapes. It was actually recorded on tapes. As the Americans had hoped, the communications were unencrypted. 
It was intelligence gold, including details of Soviet tactics and sub-patrols off the US coast. The halibut stayed in position by the cable for a week. From a military perspective, it was an unprecedented intelligence coup. Right into the 1980s, the USS Halibut and other subs would return to the cable twice a year to pick up the recordings. The Americans listened in to Soviet messages for over a decade. It's claimed that one piece of information they intercepted helped bring about the end of the Cold War. We became aware after the fact of one particular message that had enormous significance. When President Reagan was in Reykjavik at the summit with Gorbachev, Reagan had information that Gorbachev didn't, and this was about a plot to assassinate Gorbachev. And he was able to tell Gorby who was after him, and Gorbachev was able to nip that assassination plot. And that gives you some sense of why Gorbachev liked Reagan so much. The revolutionary devices used by spies and covert operatives over the years had keys and valves, dials and aerials, cameras and microfilm, emphatically proving that combat machines didn't have to rely on awesome firepower or heavy armor to win the day. <laughs> 